Okay, great. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hurst. I'm the director of the Sustainable Solutions Lab at UMass Boston, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, the Sustainable Solutions Lab is a research institute at UMass Boston focused on issues of climate justice, and we're a partnership of five different colleges and four racial and ethnic institutes on campus. We are really excited about um, this conversation this afternoon. Uh, one of the things that we've been really exploring with the Sustainable Solutions Lab is thinking about different types of resilience and how do we move beyond um, thinking about the built environment and um, sort of location-based um, issues of resilience to more human uh, personal connections. And also what are some of the ways that as we're exploring uh, resilience, we can really be um, engaging with different ways of knowing and different ways of understanding the world uh, and connecting more deeply with the arts as well. So really looking forward to um, hearing from our two presenters today. Before we get started, I wanted to um, recognize that I'm on, um, I'm currently in Boston on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people and acknowledge their near neighbors, the Nipmunk and Wampanoag um, peoples as well, all of whom are still with us today. And as we think about um, how we can develop a new inclusive future that works for everybody, recognizing um, and acknowledging past pain and histories of colonialism and racism are really important so that we can um, so that we can heal. And uh, we're going to be hearing more about that and thinking about that some today. So um, I would now like to introduce our moderator for this event. Um, Kim Zito is a um, is the program director of um, public art at the New England Foundation for the Arts. And she has a background in environmental justice and food systems change. She's really interested in the role of public art making in shifting public culture and creating social change. In 2014, Kim was part, selected to be part of the Next City Vanguard, made up of seven or seven, 40 urban leaders under the age of 40, making positive impacts in cities around the United States. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Kim, and um, thank you again so much for joining us and thank you all uh, for joining us for this conversation. Awesome, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm Kim Zito. My pronouns are she and hers, and I'm also joining us this afternoon from the traditional lands of the Massachusetts and Pawtucket peoples. And I'm so honored to introduce our guest speakers and panelists this afternoon. Um, Erin Genia is a multidisciplinary artist, educator, and community organizer. Uh, she's a member of the Sisseton Wampatan Oyate tribe, and much of her work is focused on amplifying the powerful presence of indigenous peoples on the occupied lands of America in the arts, sciences, and public realm. Uh, to invoke an evolution of thought and practice that is aligned with the cycles of the natural world and the potential of humanity. Erin um, has a master's in, the, in arts, culture, and technology from MIT and uh, a master's in tribal governance from Evergreen State College and also studied at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with and getting to know Erin through a collaboration here at NEFA that focuses on centering indigenous artist perspectives on public art. Um, and through her role as artist in residence at the city of Boston's Office of Emergency Management, she's currently working on a cultural emergency response toolkit um, that she'll share a little bit more about in her presentation. Um, and our other esteemed speaker this afternoon is Megan Venable Thomas, the Cultural Resilience Program Director at Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, Megan supports community development organizations across the country in integrating cultural and healing centered approaches for equitable development. She graduated with her doctorate in public health from Harvard University, focusing on health equity, uh, community based participatory research and healing justice. Um, with over 10 years of military experience, implementing strategies, building programs, and leading teams, she's now leveraging her varied experiences to support healthy and thriving communities. 
Um, we'll start with a brief presentation from Megan um, about the work that she's doing around a framework on holistic community development. Then we'll pivot to Erin and learn a little bit more about the interconnectedness of uh, cultural emergency, of this cultural emergency uh, before we dive into a conversation together. Um, so before I hand it over to Megan, if you have questions, please feel free to use the um, Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Megan. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, I first just want to start by also letting you know that I'm speaking to you today from Boston on the traditional lands of the Massachusetts people. Um, I'm speaking as a black woman, a descendant of slaves who were stolen from their land to come and work the soil of this land that for centuries before was stewarded, cultivated and loved by indigenous peoples. When people come together in the US, US to gather, they traditionally acknowledge and honor the ancestral holders of the land they're meeting on and I'm here today to honor those ancestors, my ancestors, and the lands that connect us all in these spaces across the country we now occupy. I ask us to remember that wherever you are in the Americas, you are in native space and that there are indigenous people that belong to that place. So may all we do in native space, spaces both honor the land and prepare the way to come. So I'm gonna start with a story. Um, to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing um, and the work that I really do across the country that has brought us to this healing centered framework that um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about. A couple of summers ago, I visited Jamaji, a, a place in Duluth that is home to 29 families um, and managed by the American Indian Community Housing Organization, also known as ACO. Jamaji um, is an Ojibwe phrase that means all of us together beginning a good life. And in our conversations with the residents and network of partners at ACO, people really emphasize not only the history of tribal communities in that place, but also the rich culture that is part of how they have survived despite generations of trauma in this place. And they also talked about impact, the impact of that having the current narrative of their community had typically been a negative one because the visibility of their community in Duluth was often around the negative, the homelessness, the poverty. The Jamaji building is very visible when you enter town and folks decided to harness that and to use that to really broadcast more about who they were as a people how they could center their own identity in this region. And in this case, the identity of the water protector. They convened a cultural and climate resilience advisory committee, which included selecting a muralist for the artwork of the water protector that you see here on the wall that's so beautiful and visible. And this is the first public artwork in Duluth representing the native community that was created by a native artist. And that's really just one piece of the story, a larger story of how ACO had centered culture and how they address food insecurity, um, and also how they really made this place, this cultural center into a resilience hub and where it held families and extended their participation and reach into environmental circles at the city level. This is what centering culture and healing can look like. Across the country, we've had conversations where we've heard stories of individual collective and intergenerational trauma. And with these came stories of healing. These facts about our history and present reality are not new. Although the data exists, although the truth has been told again and again, 2020 and 2021 has been a real wake up call for some folks. So whether we've been dealing with a natural disaster, a pandemic, violence, economic challenges, there's, it's really hard to deny that racism is a root cause of why black and indigenous and people of color face disproportionate trauma and adverse outcomes due to these challenges. 
And so faced with this complex yet unmistakable reality, we're all asking, what is needed? And a clear response that we've heard over the years and now, which has become more and more apparent, is that healing is needed. And so we understand that different outcomes require different processes. If we wanna be able to create places and spaces for healing, we must build to heal, build community, build trust, build relationships, build space for voices of those who we don't hear often that are not our own to be centered, protected and valued. And we know the impact that just having access to community development and housing and the narrative can have on people's health. We know that even if receiving the most expert care, returning to housing and community without health promoting features at best creates barriers to healing and at worst perpetuates deep chronic health disparities. I'm gonna tell a little story about my brother. His name's Morgan. And about five years ago, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. About two years ago, he had an event where he severely injured himself and was consequently institutionalized by our county in Birmingham, Alabama. Visiting him in an environment with bars on the windows where they could only go outside for a few hours a day to a park that was a paved courtyard where there were, they were fed food no health provider would advise you to eat and where social interaction was limited to those who were lucky enough to have visitors was devastating. I looked around at the other black and brown patients and leaving after each visit would bring me to tears. How could someone be expected to heal, let alone thrive in an environment like that? It was apparent to me then that the spaces we spend the majority of our lives are equally if not more important than the ones that we go to for random, random bouts of healthcare. And, and how those most vulnerable experience those spaces matters to their livelihood. So as planners, designers, health providers, practitioners, artists, we have a choice to center healing. And when we think about how these types of living conditions are exacerbated to a population level and disproportionately afforded to already marginalized communities, we can see the perpetuation of health disparities on certain groups. So perhaps you're not institutionalized like nearly a million African Americans of the 2.3 million in the US population, but instead you live in supportive housing in an apartment with little natural light with bars on your window for safety in a building with a concrete courtyard and no community spaces in a neighborhood with no access to fresh food or beauty in a segregated community created by the confines of, of redlining, we again see the perpetuation of health disparities on certain groups. And you can see where I'm going with this. My brother didn't have the ability to shape the housing he had access to. Perhaps if he had, his experience would have been different. Fortunately, he was institutionalized for less than a year, but for those who spent half of their lives or all of their lives in these spaces, how does the lack of these spaces reflection of their needs, of their identity, of who they are, of their power and agency impact their health or further exacerbate health disparities and the impact that it has on our environment? By listening, building trust, celebrating cultures, Understanding the context and history and investing in the leadership of community members, it's possible for community development to center healing, justice, and equitable recovery, which is really what resilience is all about. So we're really trying to build awareness and adoption of our healing-centered framework, which centers culture and healing, especially for Black, Indigenous, people of color, practitioners, and residents. And by building the capacity of housing developers, and creatives, culture bearers to use creative and inclusive processes that uplift community voices and cultural identity. We are building resident leadership and power and creating spaces and places that contribute to the health, the well being, and the resilience of community. So, in our framework, we're really trying to shift the way that we think about the community development practice. So, around these questions of what do we value? 
valuing cultural assets as a foundation for our resilience, thinking about holistic well being as a universal right, prioritizing the process and facilitating trust building, understanding that relationships are at the crux of how we are resilient, knowing that um, communities most resilient to any kind of disaster, including climate change, are not just um, structurally sound, but are also socially connected. And how do we reinforce social connection through trust building, moving at the speed of trust as Adrienne Marie Brown says, but also allowing our measurements, right? How we measure success to be about better relationships, better relationships with ourselves, better relationships with each other and better relationships with our land and environment, ultimately for the goal of healing and liberation as the outcomes. So within that, we have a few strategies around reflecting, involving, restoring, investing, and really reimagining what uh, this work looks like. And it also includes some tools. So the framework really helps to guide ourselves and others. It pushes us to shift our practice, guided by our work in community. It offers these principles, these strategies, and tools to support individual acknowledgement of racialized power dynamics and positionality in communities. It fosters trust building and collaboration and makes space for the restoration necessary to really spur our radical imagination in all of us in order to imagine something we've never seen in this country, which is racial equality. It requires a creativity that he, we have yet to fully unlock. And so I'm gonna quickly talk about one tool in particular, which is our healing centered lens for projects. So there are a lot of layers in this. And my personal how-to guide, as we found in this work, is going to be different from yours. We've worked to generate useful guidance for thinking through these principles and how to unpack them, especially in the context of a project you may be working on in a specific place. The more striving and searching I've done for a rule book or a formula I can follow, the more I've learned that the essential tool is to enter a situation or conversation instead of feeling I need to have the answer, the tool is to enter with a question. So it asks questions around how this project might promote healing, how it celebrates community strengths and assets, and how it prioritizes people as much as buildings. And then there's a bunch of nested questions within that, that really allows us to interrogate the way that we're addressing the strategies of reflecting and involving and restoring investing and reimagining. So how are we integrating arts and culture based processes with an intentional effort to reclaim spaces and meaning? How do we promote spaces of safety and belonging for the residents? How are we connecting folks? Um, how are we paying attention to sites and practices or materials of cultural significance that honor the assets, that acknowledge the harm that's been done and promote consciousness around the places and spaces we're spending our time? How is it emphasizing connections with the surrounding community services and organizations, understanding that we need a holistic approach to how we think about resilience and promoting healing? And ultimately power shifting, right? Where racism is successful is around taking people's power and separating and disconnecting folks. And so we're trying to rebuild that while also shifting our power from institutions to people. So how are we finding opportunities to support the residents? How are we identifying the local needs that could more specifically address, that the project can more specifically address? How are we co-creating and outreaching and implementing plans with one another? Ultimately, asset mapping is supposed to help us do the same thing, where we understand not only how the project screen can incorporate power and culture and community, but also where all the things are in our community that we can access, that we can lean upon, that we can bring into the conversation. So another tool we have is our cultural asset mapping tool. And you can find all of those in our Building to Heal framework um, that can, will be dropped or linked in the chat. Ultimately, we really want to be able to provide the support to really think about how you apply the healing centered lens in the context of community development projects or resilience projects. 
And it really helps us to align the principles and strategies that are outlined in the framework to support practitioners to enter a situation or a conversation instead of feeling like you have to have all the answers. The tool really helps you to ask the questions. And so this framework is just one way of asking the questions we need and hope to see this grow as we continue to build our collective knowledge around healing, helping us to really build to heal as the framework is called. That's all that I have, but I'm excited to enter more um, conversation about this together after we hear from Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Aaron before we dive into conversation. And yeah, please do toss your questions in the chat. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen with you. So just bear with me for a second. Okay. And I also want to apologize in advance because there's some construction work going on right next door. So apologies there. Um, so I'm just really, really excited to be here with you today and to share what I've been working on as an artist in residence for the city of Boston and just want to say thank you so much to Rebecca Hurst uh, for inviting me here. Uh, thank you, Megan Venables Thomas for the amazing work that you're doing and for speaking about it here and being in conversation and for Kinsito. It's really wonderful to, to be with you again. Um, Erin Genia Imakiapi. My name is Erin Genia. I am a Dakota person. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapitan Oyate of the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. And my pronouns are she, her. I currently reside on the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people um, and also within the traditional territory of the Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes. Um, so, so yeah, today I'll be sharing with you my project, which is called um, Cultural Emergency Response. And if you go to the uh, Boston DACA website, you will also be able to see this framework that I'll be walking you through today. Um, and you can go there and you can, um, you know, use it for uh, reference and stuff like that. So um, my work, I guess I should also frame the work by saying um, that this would not have happened without the partnership of the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, who, who I'm very grateful for, for their support through all of this, um, as well as the Office of Emergency Management. Before I get into the cultural emergency response, I thought I would share with you some of my artwork that I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm, as Ken said, I, uh, I'm a multimedia artist, and this is one of my pieces. It's called Earthling. Um, so let's see here. Earthling is, is actually a performative character, um, and it actually brings in different elements of sound as well as uh, spoken word um, and the, uh, the, the outfit of and the costume of Earthling as well. Um, I, in a way, it's sort of like an alter ego for me. Um, but the reason why that I started doing this is because my work is based on Dakota philosophies, and um, I center those in my in my work. And um, and I've I look to the thought leaders and artists and and. Um, uh, culture bearers from my tribes, um, I'm, I'm also a descendant of Ottawa tribes, um, to, uh, to help, you know, inform and, and sort of inform my work, but also like amplify those, those perspectives, um, because they're so lacking in, um, I would say, in the general um, academic and cultural fields and arts fields, although that is beginning to change. So that's really exciting. So I wanted to share with you here this um, quote by Vine Deloria Jr., who is one of one of uh, Dakota people's great thought leaders. Um, and I, I just felt like this quote said so much about um, our philosophy and that I'll just read it to you here. The imminent and expected destruction of the life cycle of world ecology can be prevented by a radical shift in outlook 
from our present naive conception of this world as a testing ground of abstract morality to a more mature view of the universe as a comprehend comprehensive matrix of life forms. So that's just, um, every time I read it, it continues to um, just be so powerful. So I created Earthling because um, I wanted to have a performative piece that would be a reminder to viewers that underneath people's closely held ideas or adopted ideologies that we are all earth-based beings, that we are of the earth, that we're not only, not only are we of the earth, but we actually are the earth. And to point out that humans have come so far away from that understanding and that really reality that we are not separate from the earth. Um, and so I feel like oh, this really informs my cultural emergency response because it changed if we if we if we made that the basis of our um, approach to addressing our major societal issues and we understood that reality. Um, you know, how would our responsibilities change? How would, how would our responsibilities to ourselves change, to, to each other and to the world around us? Um, so yeah, so that's something that I wanted to share because I feel like, you know, one of the words that keeps coming up is decolonization for me. And um, it can become, become sort of a buzzword. Um, but for me, what that means is that, um, it's a process that involves not only returning, I would say returning land to its rightful owners, but uh, an indigenous people, um, but also um, it, colonization works in our minds as well. And part of this decolonization process involves understanding this historical perspective. You know, if you look back through history, um, earth-based ways of being have been targeted for erasure um, by dominant societal forces in order to, to prop up sort of these, what I would say are false hierarchies. And so um, how do we shed those ideologies um, that have been not only harmful to us personally as individuals, but to the world around us as well? And so that's, I wanted to share that uh, with you about Earthling because I feel like Earthling is a big part of this particular um, project. Okay, so getting into um, what is a cultural emergency? Um, so, so yeah, so as a Dakota person, uh, as a community organizer, as a cultural worker, I perceive the United States to be in a state of cultural emergency. And I also see that as a society, we don't recognize it as such. And, we, and because of that, we really don't have a way to deal with it, or we have few ways to deal with it um, at that level. And in order to truly address these deep-seated issues that we face together, we have to shift our understanding to address them from a cultural lens. And so, um, you know, from, from my experience as being sort of like inside American culture as, as an American and also outside of American culture, uh, you know, because I hail from peoples who have been targeted for destruction by the dominant culture in so many ways. Um, I, you know, this is the perspective that I bring because I can see these harms so clearly. And I know that um, I can see those harms um, and so many other people can see those harms as well. I don't think that these things should be considered inevitable or acceptable, climate change, economic inequality, institutional racism, these, these horrible COVID-19 disparities, the ecological collapse that is surrounding us and indigenous people's dispossession. I don't think that those should be um, part of our culture. And, and I think that you know, we need to examine how our culture produces these so that we can end them instead of perpetuating them as we are doing. Uh, so, what I what I've been doing is um, working with the Office of Emergency Management. And so, when I first started, um, it was when the pandemic really started here in Massachusetts, and everything was closed down. And so, I was able to witness the Office of Emergency Management um, just spring into action um, to deal with this major 
public health emergency. And I could see the processes that they were um, undertaking in order to handle this, this multi-level issue. Um, and as I began to see that and learn more about um, emergencies, I really found that they, many of them do begin with systemic cultural practices and beliefs. Uh, for example, climate change and the impacts of climate change um, from anything from sea level rise to increased storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, typhoons, um, to fires that are happening um, and, and droughts and um, these sort of things, they, they're, they really come from this dominant culture's philosophy that views the earth and its systems primarily as resources to extract and profit from. So how can we use you know, this framework of emergency management to address problems at a cultural level is something that I've started, started to kind of percolate for me. And um, in order to begin that process, which I think it's a, it's a challenging process, um, is to define what is a cultural emergency. And so um, I, my definition is that it's a state of instability and danger that converges across a broad range of people, places, events that stem from cultural practices. And as an artist, I work in the field of arts and culture, and um, I found that we place a lot of emphasis on arts and not as much on the side of culture that is defined as sort of more like our collective practices that are embedded in the daily rituals of life. Um, yet those cultural elements are at the heart of how our society functions. The ideologies and the philosophies that drive our culture determine how our economic, political, social systems are established and how they operate. And those doctrines that fuel societal progress can create and have created so much harm and they, and they can lead and are leading to these large scale disasters. So what do we do about that? They're urgent, you know, these issues are urgent, but in many ways, the issues also have had very like long-term um, roots or, or sort of like ongoing, they're kind of like ongoing contributing factors that can be difficult to um, come to grips with. So I think for me, the first step is, is saying, Yes, we are in a state of cultural emergency and, and recognizing that, you know, with each passing day, we have more evidence that, that um, we are in a state of cultural emergency. People are, are demanding change on so many different issues. And we're, we're witnessing how unchecked cultural emergencies continue to intensify. They create um, deeper and deeper intertwined disasters at every level of society. And, Ultimately, they increase people's susceptibility to hazards and limit collective resiliency. So, but I think the thing that is so tough is that even though, even though we're seeing this, we're still so um, resistant to altering this trajectory. And how long can we continue on this way? You know, how long should we continue on, on this way? So, so these are some of the questions that I've been sort of grappling with and you know, when I realized that there are really very few ways to actually evaluate, transform, or stop these cultural practices outside of mass protest movements, violent or nonviolent revolution, war or societal collapse, those are kind of like our options. But what if, what if we had ways that we could correct course um, to address the harmful byproducts of our culture? And, um, I think that we need to begin to build cultural transformations into our society to recalibrate our systems, like our political, economic, and social systems. So, um, so this this is a uh, little bit of graphic design that I did. Um, city of City of Boston uh, seal with sea level rise, and. Um, so I guess then we, we should go into what are the byproducts of American culture that are so harmful. Um, and these are things that I would say that result in regular economic, political, or, or, or they stem from um, regular economic, political, and social activities. And I think that 
the thing about them is that they're sort of like normalized or accepted as collateral damage but they create emergencies for people. And they range in scale from personal to societal to historical. So some, so this is not a complete list, but some of the ones are obviously climate change, which is why we're having this conversation today, um, as well as institutional racism and white supremacy, environmental catastrophes from resource extraction, mass extinctions, extreme political polarization, global war, militarism, and the possibility of nuclear annihilation, genocide, refugee crises, slavery, human trafficking, and incarceration, technologies that are divorced from natural world-based wisdom, pandemics and other epidemics, and continual colonization around the world and the impacts of colonization. Um, so here is a, a piece that I did that is a sculpture of an oil spill that shows how humans are both responsible for it, but also endangered by uh, this addiction to oil. And so I'm going to move forward. Sorry, I'll um, go a little faster here. So um, then, you know, I wanted to figure out, well, how did we get here? And so these cultural norms that we, that I'm gonna be talking about in a couple seconds are, they stem from the imperial philosophies of Western European colonialism and the Roman empire. And we can never forget that this country is a settler state that gained its economic wealth and political power from genocide, land theft, slavery, and war. And this deep legacy of ongoing trauma to indigenous people and those that the United States marginalizes, it, it, it just can, keeps on going. Um, also wanna mention that Boston as an epicenter of colonization for this continent, I think our communities should be looking at these issues and think about our role in that. Um, so some of the ways of thinking uh, that I identified, and again, not a complete list, but um, the ways of thinking and acting that inform our culture and create emergencies are toxic individuality and separation from the natural world and others, hierarchical and binary thinking and authoritarianism, misogyny and toxic masculinity, short-term thinking, idealizing greed and consumerism, using violence as a tool and coercion through brute force and fear of dispossession, this Western cultural supremacy and assimilation, historical amnesia, competition instead of cooperation, wastefulness and the squandering of energy resources and labor, cultural appropriation, undervaluing youth, elders, and the extended family. So, so those are some of the things that I see. And, and I think the important thing is that with, with this um, cultural emergency response framework um, is that it is up to communities to decide, you know, what are those harmful, um, ways of thinking, those harmful philosophies. So here's a piece that I did called Invisible. And Invisible provides me with a symbolic skin of protection against pervasive cultural supremacy. Um, so in the Kota culture, we talk a lot about, you know, what is our responsibility to each other. And so, um, you know, we, I think that's shifting shifting the conversation a bit uh, towards what are our responsibilities? Who is culpable? when addressing issues at a cultural level. And because culture permeates all sectors of life, it begins with personal decisions and then familial decisions and community activities. And from there, it expands to municipal, regional, national, and systemic operations. So in order to be accountable, not only of those philosophies that guide our societies, institutions, and leaders, we also have to think of our own um, impacts our own thinking and action and role. And so as a community organizer for many years, I faced burnout a lot because what I found was that in my work with social movements to hold institutions and systems accountable, in my organizing communities, um, we were just, in many ways, we, the process of, of rethinking how we acted takes, takes a very long time. How, how, the process of rethinking our own roles can be very difficult. Um, 
And in some ways we were kind of automatically and subconsciously continuing to uphold those cultural, same cultural philosophies that contribute to and cause you know, injustice and inequality that we're fighting against on different levels. Um, so that's why I also wanted to bring it back to this idea of culture. You know, what is our, what are the cultural philosophies that we're drawing from in order to move ourselves forward? Um, so then how does this connect back to emergency management techniques? So I thought this was really a powerful way to address it because um, emergency management protocols and procedures kind of work behind the scenes and they provide funding resources and people power to rapidly fix dire issues. They plan for every contingency and they strategize and budget for in the phases before, after, and during an emergency um, to ensure public safety. And I really felt like this is the kind of effort we need, you know, to address root causes of major societal emergencies like institutional racism, economic inequality. If we were to see economic inequality as an emergency and take steps in that way, um, we, could, we could solve it. Um, so this model, I think, you know, is important it can help to streamline processes and provide networks and everything and everything like that, but that ultimately it, it, it needs to be centered in um, you know the unique needs of each community. And but I also want to stress that we have many tools already available um, as, as Megan was sharing as well. Um, many movements, leaders, scholars, artists, community workers, agencies and organizations have already done the work of determining the root causes of our cultural emergency and proposing and, and enacting solutions. So a cultural emergency response um, can bring these ideas and practices together to contribute to a more widespread grassroots cultural change that is required of this moment. And so some of the things that I've been working on, the creative outputs for my residency have included this um, cultural emergency kit giveaway. So people um, have been nominating cultural emergency first responders and um, I've been creating these, assembling these kits of, of art products that I make, and then also um, things, uh, wellness items and foods and things and tea seeds and uh, uh, things that are made by Native American owned businesses. Um, another piece that I'm doing right now, I'll play the video for you in a second, is a, uh, a beaded cultural emergency response vest based on um, Dakota, traditional Dakota beading. Um, and I've also been working with community members um, to meet with the Boston Art Commission and bring more native voices into the public sphere through art uh, to confront colonial myths in Boston's public space. So now I'm gonna just play this video for you. It's very short. <laughs> So there you have it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and the best isn't done yet, but I'm still working on it. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin and Megan too. This, you've given us so much um, knowledge and wisdom to sit with and to marinate on. And um, yeah, some things that are really sticking out to me. Erin, um, you said colonization works in our minds and we're deconstructing some of those false hierarchies and um, thinking about the healing centered work, Megan, that you're doing and, um, and, and the first responders kit, it, it's all coming full circle um, that you're caring for the healing of, of those on the front lines as well. And um, I, I just love how your work um, speaks to one another. <laughs> um, diving into our conversation here, um, something that I've been thinking about uh, just thinking about the urgency of, of all of the crises that, that you've brought up. Um, you know, there's the, the climate crisis, the cultural crisis of decolonizing our minds here. 
um, in this moment where there's so much intersectionality across the injustices, how are you thinking about time and being able to see or measure impact? Um, kind of moving beyond the immediate results as a measure of success, how are you, how are you seeing arts and culture contribute to um, or sustain climate resilience in communities? Um, that one to me. Sure, either, either one of you, feel free to jump in. Erin, would you like to respond? Um, I could respond or, or you could- Sure, go first. ahead. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the question. I think it's a really important question because especially in thinking about this emergency response framework, um, most of emergency management techniques are meant for short-term you know, problems, short-term emergencies. Um, however, climate change operates on a very different time scale than that. It's, it almost operates at uh, like an atmospheric you know, time scale. And so I think that um, we need to be thinking about time a little bit differently in, in our world, that these, these concepts of time that we have um, that are also embedded within our culture are maybe helpful in some ways, but maybe not so helpful. For example, um, you know, having been a part of different political activities and organizing and stuff like that, there's so much emphasis placed on the next election cycle. And how do you get things done that are sort of in a long-term sense when you're always kind of campaigning for the next election cycle? Um, you know, in, in looking at the leadership of Dakota people, um, our leaders are always looking into the future to different, to, to, to future generations. What, and what kind of a legacy that we're leaving for future generations. And at the same, at the same, in the same way, looking to our ancestors and saying, and asking, you know, how are we honoring what they went through in order for us to be here today? And so, um, you know, so that's, that's the perspective, that's the perspective that I sh can bring and, and share. But I also think that um, the way we think about time is, is not necessarily helping us, um, you know, even just thinking of like being kind of stuck on Zoom calls all day for, for, for work. Um, you know, the time, time has been so weird in the pandemic too and, and being connected to the internet and the computer. So it's like, how can we sort of rethink time is a question. So I guess I'm, I'm answering your question with another question, <laughs> sorry. Those are my favorite because I feel like I like to enter with questions always and respond with questions because, you know, none of us have all the answers. We're all trying things on. Um, and I think, you know, the housing sector has and community development has really in, uh, measured impact through the lens of number of units produced or preserved or retrofitted or um, you know, how, how are we producing things in response to the physical um, aspects of climate change? However, we know that research demonstrates that brick and mortar alone doesn't cultivate thriving, sustainable communities. And housing and community development without a comprehensive understanding of people, right, um, and people's collective, collective lived experiences and meeting people where they are and understanding their inherent strengths and assets has really potential significant harm uh, and cultural erasure and perpetuation of trauma. And so in our framework, we're really talking about how we're shifting the idea of what we measure, of what we even believe that should be measured because what we measure as Adrian Marie Brown also says, like what we pay attention to grows. And so what we focus our attention on is what is going to grow, is what is going to thrive. And so if we think about what we're measuring and what is in, as, and, and equally what is as important as being in the right relationship with ourselves, with each other, and with the land for which we are stewards, um, especially regarding the development of brick and mortar, then it really shifts what our approach is, as well as what our outcomes are, are going to be. If, my, if I'm measuring having a better relationship with myself, knowing who I am and my positionality 
to racism in the world, as well as my relationship with Aaron, as what we want to measure, right? Like improving relationships, then what kind of outcomes will we start to have that might be different? And I think just the shift in what we focus on and what we pay attention to shifts like what we'll see grow and thrive in a different way. Yeah, I really love all of that. Um, thinking about where we're investing our time is where things will grow and um, being in the right relationship. It, it makes me think like, you know, how do we hold oil companies accountable to their, the way they're wreaking havoc <laughs> on this earth? And what if we measure their success, not by um, imaginary things that they're trading, but <laughs> um, carbon emissions <laughs> or like, how would we, how, how could we measure it differently through the relationships that they have with communities with right <laughs> right like and then then there's a different accountability measure right yeah. I'm not just accountable to who is paying for me to do x y and z mm -hmm. I'm accountable to the people who are most impacted by the decisions that I'm making on the land on people on the environment you know and the people who are actually experiencing that environment so yeah. it I think not only creates um a different way of thinking and living but it also creates accountability structures for how we do our work that's different as well. Yeah, and it takes me back to Aaron's first responder toolkits, um, care kits, because it's it's like, why do we, why do first our first responders or community organizers um, need this? It's because they're getting burnt out because they're doing all the accountability <laughs> holding. Um, because we're thinking, you're thinking about relationships with community, but what if with what if other players in this work were thinking about um, relationship and measuring success by relationship? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about that. You know, what what are what are some of the lessons from the work that you're doing that you would share with um, you know scientists, researchers, planners, activists, everyday community members who recognize and understand that. We're in a moment of cultural emergency. We're in this climate emergency. Um, we all need to be doing something in this moment. Um, what, what are some lessons, or what are some things you would share thinking about the complexity of both the problems and the solutions? Um, what, are, what are examples that you're seeing in the field? Um, I could share a little bit about the cultural emergency kits, the first responders, the cultural emergency first responders. Um, I, the, it, it's been really amazing to read the different nominations that people have put forward for the kits. Um, I was brought to tears thinking of how these folks are giving their all for their communities. They, they're asking for nothing in return. And they're um, filling in the gaps that our social systems, our political systems, our economic systems are not providing for people. And, um, and so I, I just want to give a shout out to all of the people who are doing that because that's work that is unseen, you know, it's, it is unappreciated. Um, and in some ways, it's, there's a hostility towards it as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, from, from like political or economic, or even social um, orders. But um, I think that during this time of cultural emergency, with the pandemic in particular, um, just seeing how teachers have stepped forward to uh, work with their students to make sure that their students have what they need. Those people who are underserved, those students who are underserved, um, healthcare workers, um, people who are um, working on the front lines as essential workers, um, working in grocery stores. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think that we need to have a, we need to really be appreciating the work that people are doing to, to help us get what we need, food, um, to, to support 
um, our learning to to make sure that you know our kids are um, have what they need through these times. And um, yeah, so I I just thought I would share that. Yeah, I love that the diversity of first responders um, is in direct contrast with something we were talking about yesterday. How colonization tends to oversimplify culture and what we think of as like, how do we approach this? Um, but really how we approach it is, is going to be a lot more diverse than we might be imagining right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think there are beautiful examples everywhere you look. Um, if you just look and, and have been out there forever, right? This is not new that people have been standing up have been stepping out, have been putting their bodies on the line, have been putting their lives on the line to try and create, right? And restore these disconnections in relationship to the land, to one another, to um, other folks and community. And so I do think, you know, one of the things, I, and I don't think our framework necessarily makes that any better, right? Like folks have been doing this and will continue to do it with or without <laughs> our little framework um, because that's just what people do. But I do think that, the, that this framework is also offering a different way for practitioners to think um, and to navigate uh, the opportunities and the importance of rest and restoration as part of the work. Um, because I think within the field of community development in particular, Black and Indigenous professionals have a particularly precarious role as they're often tasked to identify and address and heal generationally inherited manifestations of racial trauma in their own personal lives, reconcile secondary trauma exposure potentially experienced by working in oppressed communities and navigate organizational systems and work cultures that reinforce white dominant structures and ethnic tokenism. And so often as professionals are vulnerable to traumatization while working to protect black and indigenous people vulnerable to trauma within systems of perpetual racial trauma and um, one thing we want to offer in this framework is that if trauma can be passed down, so can healing. And how do we afford the opportunities to make space for what you need? First, identifying that we're burning out because this is the work that we do when we show up every day to do this work in our communities as members of these institutions. And so it's to try and shift the institution um, but also to shift our understanding of how we have to show up or don't and what flexibility and necessity we need to invest in ourselves and our own healing in order to even be able to show up at all. Uh, and so I think that's one of the nuances that really is trying to, and a lot of folks like Nat Ministry and other people are, are talking about the importance of stepping forward and stepping back and filling your cup first to be able to fill others. And I love that you also called out, oops, sorry, I was just gonna say, you, you've also called out specificity. Like it's not a one size fits all, like not everybody needs the NAP ministry. <laughs> I mean, maybe we all need the NAP ministry after this year, but. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Erin, you were about to say something. I was just gonna say that is so powerful. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. I mean, and I'm actively trying it on, right? Always, yeah. because to your point, Erin, about decolonizing, like decolonizing takes us also asking ourselves the questions over and over again. What am I doing? Is that thing actually a socialized thing from mm. existing within this structure? Or is this what my ancestors would have told me to do in this situation? And yeah. how some, some of my ancestors might have told me that, but that's because they were trying to survive, you know? So like, how can you really decouple and break some of those things apart? And sometimes you need the space, the, the imagination, the dreams, the art, 
the culture to be able to fully see that, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like in order for us to imagine new possibilities to see to see ourselves into the future, we're gonna need to get to a place where we can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm recognizing that there are some questions popping up in the Q&A box, but before we pivot to our audience questions, I did wanna ask a question about hope. Um, where are you seeing hope and what brings you hope in this moment? I am seeing hope all around, um, kind of the same way when you're looking at, you know, what are the examples of the work that's being done? I think that's what makes me hopeful is that I step outside, even though the pollen is crazy, if you're here in Boston, like never before, but it is also a physical embodied reminder that the environment is thriving in a different way that it wasn't a year ago or two years ago, you know, um, or three years ago. And so I think I'm hopeful as I see the ways in which people are adapting to the crisis of our time, the emergency of, of this healing response and that people are really meeting it with, um, with grace, um, are meeting it with arts and beauty um, and are meeting it with taking time for themselves if they need it and taking space. And I love how I'm seeing more folks step into that. And it makes me very hopeful that that will continue to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, was, I was thinking of, of one thing that gives me hope, and thank you for this question, it's an awesome question, um, is how much ecosystem restoration can address a lot of the cultural emergencies that we're facing. And, and if you look at, and you know, doing that in the right way, of course, within community. But um, one of the things that gives me hope is that uh, looking at different ecosystem restoration projects um, in, in all over the globe, it's amazing how quickly the systems of the earth come back and flourish in those sites. And, um, you know, I was, I was uh, thinking a lot about dam removal um, recently and how quickly the, the, um, the fish would come back and they would begin to have their, uh, their life cycles in the places where they had never, you know, had been kept out of for so long. So I think, I mean, I have hope because nature this natural world is is a, the life force is so powerful. I'm a mom and I have children and I and I know that um, that they're going to be inheriting this this world and uh, you know I'm I'm trying my best to make sure that they have the knowledge and uh, um, tools to to help them do that and and they're so eager and they're so smart. Like I have so much hope when I work with youth. Um, and they're just, they're amazing. And I think for me, that's like a big, a big thing too, working with you. I love that. I'm thinking about this next generation. Um, well, thank you both for sharing about your work and, and answering some questions. I'm just gonna pull up the, the Q&A and maybe just work through these, um, starting with Mallory. Uh, Mallory says, um, I find that folks who haven't engaged in healing work, um, uh, working with folks who haven't engaged with healing work, it's helpful to explain what healing is and why it's vital um, to what they may be calling equitable community development. How does your org or framework break down what the process of healing is and how it works? Yes, um, thank you for that question, Mallory. Hey. Um, that's a friend of mine, um, always asking the hard questions. No, it's not a hard question. Um, uh, I think first to talk, before talking a little bit about healing centered, I wanna talk a little bit about trauma, which is our body's response to a distressing event that makes it difficult for a person to cope. And so oftentimes we think of acute trauma like an assault um, or something that happens to someone. But what we know is that trauma is much more intersectional. It can be acute or continuous, cumulative, individual or collective. 
And so when we think of something like chattel slavery, Jim Crow, anti-Black terrorism, lynchings, um, witnessing murders of unarmed Black people on television by the police, dignity violations, those are all violent and collective, structural, historical, intergenerational forms of trauma. Um, and so when we, so healing is the body's natural response of restoring health. And so if trauma disrupts our health, then healing can restore it. And if we understand that trauma is intersectional, then we also understand that healing should be as well. And so a healing centered approach which was kind of coined by Dr. Sean Jinwright, recognizes that we aren't harmed in a vacuum, right? Like even someone who is assaulted, in my military job, I do sexual assault response coordination. So even someone who's sexually assaulted, right? What often is not about sex, it's about power. And so really sex is, is sexual assault is not within a vacuum itself either, right? There are all of these systemic issues that helped to perpetuate that incident happening. And so when we understand that we're not harmed in a vacuum, then we aren't healed in one either. And so to heal from collective traumas, we must take collective approaches. And so why that's important to community development is that community development itself has also caused, right? Significant intergenerational, historical, acute um, traumas in the ways in which decisions have been made to disconnect and separate people from land, from themselves and from each other. Um, and so entering with a healing centered approach helps us to think not only about what we're designing but what we're undesigning because there are active systems of oppression and violence and trauma that are baked into our practice. And so when we think about the ways in which we're designing and we're participating in, in, in development that is equitable, it requires a collective approach, understanding people that are most impacted, shifting power to, to them so that they are making decisions about the communities that they want to live in and experience and creating trust and relationship building in that practice and process, which just makes us think just a little bit differently about how we are not only understanding how we need to be prepared to do it community, participation, but also the approach and process of doing that. So sorry, that was a long answer, but <laughs> I just wanted to like talk about the full scope of why this approach um, is so critically important, I think, particularly to community development. Thank you so much for breaking that down. Um, let's see, our next question is for Erin. Um, Gabriel asks, um, often it takes an emergency to snap people out of their busy routines of business and pleasure. Even a small emergency can bridge certain social barriers and enable mutual communication for the first time in addition to necessary mutual aid uh, that the emergency makes visible. How does, uh, how does art challenge this or not, especially performance, um, uh, performance or use of the emergency vests um, and textile? how does your art challenge this? Yeah. Thank you for this question. Um, well, I think there's a, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of ways to answer this question. Um, and I, I, what I'm thinking is that on the one hand, so I was sharing this project with a friend of mine who's, who's not from the United States. And, and she said, why do we need to have an emergency to deal with these issues? Why, why is everything, you know, why do we wait until it's an emergency to deal with it? And some, sometimes we, when we wait, it's too late. And um, so that, I, yeah, that really got me to thinking a lot because um, I was thinking how, you know, we're very primed in this culture to sort of do that, you know, to have this emergency response to like, okay, things are bad, things are really bad now, and we're gonna fix it, and then we're gonna move on. Um, and yet we don't look at the root causes. So I think, you know, taking a step back from that um, concept and understanding it like from, uh, from what Megan was saying about types of trauma, you know, there's acute, there's continuous intergenerational, there's also those kind of emergencies too. And how do we, um, 
how do we create a response that is to those things that it reflects what the thing is and and um and not just have like a one size fit all fits all kind of a, a, an approach so um so that's sort of some some thinking that i have about that and then at the same time though um i i feel like cultural emergency response also takes and uses that um, and sort of tries to flip it around a little bit. Like it takes this concept of emergency and um, in, the, in emergency management strategies and procedures and things like that, um, a lot of times existing structures are used, you know, to, to help with the situation. And so um, I was thinking a lot about that. Like, how can I take this structure of emergency response and sort of like restructure it to look at cultural emergencies. And um, so I think that my this project, you know, not only is it um, using that, but it's also like self-aware and it asks why, you know, why does it take an emergency for us to actually do something about these issues? Thank you for that. Yeah, I was just thinking. How do we turn cultural emergency response into cultural resilience rather than just responding we're building the muscles um, by using the existing resources and, and strengthening our ability to not be in an emergency i love that question <laughs> it's such a simple question that really gets to the heart of the situation <laughs> um, our next question is from um Dor dorcas and the question is um, we can't talk about culture and leave the aging populations. In this pandemic, what is the role of the aging populations and have the aging populations uh, been given the opportunity to share their experience of previous pandemics and how to preserve the, the nature during pandemic? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think aging populations are critically important um, when we think about some folks who are most impacted and isolated during some of our existing crises around COVID, um, as well as climate change, as well as, um, you know, all the things really, um, particularly urbanization, you know, um, that I think our aging population or our ancestors are really ones who hold so much wisdom and knowledge around what's happening, right? I talk to my grandparents who are like, this ain't new. We were doing the same thing. We were doing this or that, you know, and we did it this way. And so how do we, to the point, like really incorporate the learnings and lessons, the opportunities and stories of our ancestors to be able to inform the approaches that we're taking forward. Um, and I think, you know, from a cultural perspective, um, and it's particularly if you are folks who, like me, who came from descendants of slaves, right? Like how erasure was part of the process of inculcating people into the work um, of, of capitalism in this country. So, you know, when we think about how critically important some of those tools are to our resilience that were lost or taken or stolen from us, I think it's really important. So thinking about the aging population or the history of people and understanding how to hold on to that is super important because we can't change the future if we don't understand the past um, and where we've come from. And so I think Populations, all populations of people are incorporated in the framework that we're thinking about um, intergenerationally. Yes, I, I agree with that. I think intergenerational approaches are what we must do. And I think a lot about this because um, one of the things that happened here in the United States with colonization is that the traditional family structure of an extended family um, or tioshpe was um, deliberately um, 
I wouldn't, I'm not gonna say destroyed, but was deliberately targeted for destruction and uh, put in place instead, instead uh, put in place this uh, nuclear family. And so um, I think, you know, thinking about this, this cultural philosophy of sort of separating and, and boxing things into categories and, and keeping things separate from one another. Um, you know, I think that, that thinking about our families and the ways that our, we're, you know, our relatives are connected to us and how they support us in, in various different ways um, and how um, our elders are the people who are um, providing us with a direction of where to go. Um, that is something that we have come so far away from and in, in our current society. And I'm very interested in, you know, thinking of ways to, to overcome that or to address that, um, particularly with regard to um, assimilation of uh, in the United States and how um, you know this sort of cultural supremacy weaves its way into our the structures that that um, we have to deal with and and thinking of the nuclear family as you know sort of this unit of our society. Um, I think we need to be, think beyond that a bit and. Um, have an intergenerational approach. I so appreciate bringing it back to the intergenerational, not just honoring our youth, but honoring our elders. And um, it makes me think, Erin, earlier you were talking about, you know, how could we measure success based on um, how we're honoring our ancestors and how are we honoring our living ancestors? <laughs> Those who are still among us today, um, but have so much wisdom um, to offer us in this moment. Um, how are we measuring our success based on the way we're honoring that knowledge? Um, you, let's see. Okay, we've got two more questions here and it looks like we're right on time. <laughs> uh, this next question, what Megan is saying is really resonating with my takeaways from participatory grant making and the potential to see relationships, learning, trust as outcomes more than just the way it produced or services delivered is participatory grant making um, part of the tool set. Yes, so we mentioned participatory grant making, um, but we're actually working on some new tools for the next iteration that we'll be launching. Um, and so that is something that we're hoping to include. But one thing that we've also been working on is instead of a logic model, which is often a way in which people like to present their activities as they're connected to their inputs and outputs and impact um, is a, a feeling or being model uh, that really explores the way in which um, our actual ways of being have changed um, that have particular impact um, at different levels and at different time frames. And so I think that also kind of makes space for these ideas around trust building and relationship building being actual um, outcomes and impacts that really change the ways in which um, our work lands on the ground. So thank you for that question. And our last question is um, wondering what first steps um, someone might be able to take to further some of this work. I, I can just say that I'm, I made the, the website um, so that people could refer to that um, boston.gov uh, pay a series of pages about cultural emergency response. And so I created that to be a reference or a guide to help people sort of begin to think it's really a tool to just sort of start conversations about this and to start thinking and just kind of spark a little bit. And so that's where I'm at with it right now um, with the residency. And I know that, you know, this work has been um, very important to me and I know that I will continue to do the work. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what form that will take, um, but um, I think, 
for right now, offering that website as a resource is, is what I can do. Thank you. Yeah, um, please check out the framework. Uh, Melanie also dropped that in the chat. Um, we've been doing a lot of conversations, workshop trainings on the approach and how this could integrate or align with whatever approaches that you're doing currently. So if you're thinking about a new project, a way of implementing it um, and have questions about how a healing centered approach could work for what you're thinking about, um, please reach out. We'd be happy to have conversations with you to talk about what um, support could look like. And the tools that I mentioned today are included in that framework. So you can check that out as well. Awesome, thank you. And it looks like Melanie has tossed the links to, um, to both of your work in the chat. So if folks wanna connect with Erin or Megan, you can um, go to those sites. And um, I think I'm supposed to hand this over to Rebecca. <laughs> awesome. Yes, great. Well, thank you all so much for this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm left with a lot of really, um, like you were saying, Megan, new questions to answer the other questions and um, <clears throat> really excited to continue to think with you all about what, um, you know, generative cultural resilience looks like and what are the ways that we're fostering new ways and old ways of knowing um, and weaving those more deeply into our work as we try and prepare for our shifting and changing realities. So thank you all so much for joining us. And um, also wanted to thank Melanie Long so much for all of your help with this event um, and Patricio Belois as well. Um, super appreciative of the Sizzle team behind the scenes. And um, wanted to share that we have a lunch and learn event next week on Wednesday at noon. Um, Melanie, do you mind sharing that link in the chat as well? Um, that is focused, we've been having a series looking at climate justice partnerships. And um, we started with a number of awesome uh, community-based um, organizing groups around the country um, and asked them, who have you partnered with to advance climate justice and what have those partnerships looked like? How have those been helpful? Uh, so we had folks from um, New York, Miami, Chicago, and we're bringing it home with um, Green Roots in Chelsea and a partner of theirs, um, Madeline Scammell from BU uh, next week. So hope you'll be able to join us for that. And thank you all again um, for this conversation and looking forward to um, seeing where these ideas continue to take us.